David Mocklow, you know, why don't you describe who you are and what you do for the audience? Yeah, so um, I have, I've been in the States for, oh gosh, now 23 years. I moved from Bermuda uh, in 1997. Um, my American wife, I think at the time, was happy to sort of make a change back to the States. Uh, and I moved to Chicago um, in the middle of a snowstorm, which is sort of ironic for a guy from the beaches. You were like, and, what, uh, what kind of Armageddon did I land in here? Yeah, it's funny because uh, because when I landed there and it was 22 inches of snow, I thought, you know, what the hell am I doing here? Uh, but it was a chance for me to get off the island and get involved in what was at the time sort of a new emerging uh, area of the insurance market, which is using securitization to transfer catastrophe risk into the capital markets. I was um, I, I was sort of of the view uh, early on, maybe probably earlier than most people, that that was going to be a big driver of success for the insurance industry. I think most people looked at the few of us who were involved in that business at the time as though we had lost our minds. Mm -hmm. uh, but it sort of seemed to me to be obvious that securitization was going to have an impact on our industry. I was maybe more enthusiastic about how quickly it would impact the industry. And, and I got my, my timing wrong, maybe. But I think all of us can look around now and know that securitization was probably the first real big sea change in the market structure of the insurance industry, right? Yeah, we had a few property cat companies in Bermuda that started up, but really securitization really sort of changed the way that people thought about the transfer of risk from a client all the way to the end markets where that risk was born. Um, yeah, so there, I, there, was a, there was a new source of capacity. I, I always look at um, the securitization as uh, when people talk, you, there, were, there was this big push lately about how these insure techs were going to come in and disrupt the market. Yep. I said, if you think about insurance, the real big disruption that occurred was with securitization. Uh, absolutely. You absolutely. Know, it just changed the way that reinsurance was and how risk was seeded and how people thought about that. It's just a gigantic new source of capacity that really drove prices down. Yeah, and if you think about the logical conclusion for that evolution – we may never get to this logical conclusion, by the way, it would suggest that insurance companies aren't really designed to be large consumers of risk, but really manufacturers of risk for that risk to be ultimately sent into the capital markets. And maybe over time, the most efficient form of an insurance carrier is what I think is someone who's a specialist who can sort of take what would theory, theoretically be the risks that the capital markets aren't good at, right? So they're really getting overpaid for the difference in conditions, if you will, the DIC coverage that they provide and let all the, the, the if you will, the lower cost capital take all the rest of the risks. Um, we'll see. I mean, we've had a few attempts to get beyond property cat. You know, we've had Generali did a, an auto transaction that looked at uh, securitization of auto uh, claims on the liability side. We've had some things done now in the mortgage marketplace, which is sort of ironic given insurers uh, never liked to uh, get involved in stuff that they held on their asset side of their balance sheet. Yeah. Uh, we've seen a pandemic deal done by the World Bank. So I th I'm optimistic that that market will continue to evolve. Um, but I think that's not the only change we see sweeping through the industry. Obviously, now we're seeing much more market structure change anyway, right? So now we've got more MGAs than ever before. We've got more fronting companies than ever before. All of those, all of that market change is sort of really mind-blowing when you look back at the industry 20, 20 years ago and you had a broker, a large carrier, and maybe a few very giant reinsurance companies. It really yeah. is amazing. Yeah. So, you know, uh, just recently in the last couple of years, I think uh, the, the cat events that have occurred where I think you might be on the right track in terms of what you're describing, which is, um, you know, seeding off uh, risks to the lower cost capacity would be wildfire in that it would be, it's, um, it's going to be, it would be extremely, so you see carriers starting to leave California, yeah. um, you know, leaving the uh, exposure that's there. And the difficult is, how do you define wildfire versus fire? They can't, they're not going to be able to cleave that off 
And so now I'm thinking, well, if they don't even want to write fire, what, what is their purpose? It, it, it's, it's, it's that existential thought has crossed my mind when I, when I see that they're fleeing fire now. I understand why, but if we're going to have that sort of discussion, it's um, why do they even need to exist if they're not going to even write fire? Yeah, and, and I think you can, you can extend that example to other risks, right? There are, um, and, and some of it is, is not so much the existential nature within one region, but, you know, other things that might affect global, like pandem the pandemic that we're going yep. through right now, right? How does the insurance industry grapple with something so big and so cumbersome? And could securitization, as an example, be a way for the, you know, the industry to respond um, and partner with, uh, with other entities like the government? So that, you know, you're right, your, your fire example is a good one, but the pandemic is another one where securitization could be a potential tool, right? Uh, what do you think? Because I don't think the traditional insurance capacity is going to touch this with a 10-mile pole. They're going to stay. I mean, they're already really nervous that they're going to get dragged into this anyways. I'd like your opinion on that at some point in this conversation. But let's talk about the pandemic and let's talk about um, what – could potentially be the different avenues to try to do that, including securitization. Yeah, I, I think this one is hard, right? Because we're looking at it at the moment in the in the middle of a storm, excuse the, the pun. Yeah. And because of that, people are sort of caught up in solutions that might be applied retroactively versus what can we do to create a sustainable way to manage the risk going forward. So I, I'm always careful about not saying too much that could be construed as a solution for the current environment, because I believe the current environment creates the sort of large loss that really the industry is not designed to handle well, yeah. right? It's, it's too big an event. Even if we thought there was reasonable mechanisms to, to, for the industry to, to get involved with or, or participate in, the size of the event is so ginormous as to sort of make those solutions, if you will, not tenable. Um, I want to come back to my view on what we might do going forward. Um, one of the things I worry though right now about in, in the market discussions is this concept of sort of changing the way that the insurance contracts are interpreted. And I think there's a much bigger question that should be asked by everybody looking at this right now, which is the constitutionality of amending our contract law. There's some serious questions as to the ramifications for doing that. And that, those go far beyond uh, the question of interpreting insurance contracts. We've had a lot of states raise, you know, legislation or, you know, raise the prospect of legislation for reworking contract law. Um, I, I, I'm surprised by the lack of uh, news media around the impact of changing contract law, right? That would change everything we have we we love and yeah. hold dear about this country not just the way we interpret insurance contracts so i'm surprised by that um and it's way above my pay grade as to how we deal with that but i think the, the reality is this is this is an event that needs for the moment a government-led response but what we do about it in the future is an important topic right because this will not be the only time we have these events there'll be events like this in the future you're your forest fire event was a good example, right? What are large events that the industry is not equipped to deal with well? How are we gonna handle those in the future? Um, and what the insurance industry is really good at doing, if you will, is analyzing and administering risk, and in some cases, financing risk, but in other cases, the risk financing is too hard, it's too big. So let's let them do what I think they're good at doing, uh, administrating risk, maybe risk managing risk, you know, differentiating between high risk um, clients and low risk clients and finding other ways to finance the actual losses when yeah. they occur. One solution could potentially be to tap into the capital markets and get pandemic triggers uh, that, that create some capacity. Now, of course, that raises questions as to whether or not we understand how to price that risk. Um, and the World Bank transaction, it would be interesting to see what people ultimately think about how they price the risk of an Ebola uh, outbreak that wasn't triggered, even though there was theoretically an uh, Ebola outlook that uh, outbreak that could have triggered the contract. So the pricing around 
the pandemic version of capital markets is an open question. Um, so, but I hope, my hope is that securitization would be a so part of the solution set. But I think ultimately the solution is going to look a lot more like a flood insurance response, um, uh, maybe a crop insurance response. You know, there are various attributes in those models that work well uh, that could be applied here. Um, but I think it's sort of, I think we have to be really careful to differentiate between the stuff that's being talked about for a retroactive uh, response and what we do ultimately down the road for the future. Yeah. So you, you kind of touched on a couple of these. I think we have certain frameworks globally um, where, you know, individual country countries or provinces, municipalities have tried to tackle that. Uh, we have the NFIP here in the States. Um, I'm actually a big fan of flood re in the UK where the, um, the, the flood re entity acts as a reinsurer and allows uh, the uh, carriers, they, they, they force them to offer flood coverage and then they can seed off whatever they want to seed off and keep what they want to keep. And, and that's a, I, to me, that seems like a good dividing line. Then we have, as you mentioned, crop insurance, which I don't know a heck of a lot about, but I know it's uh, you know, heavily government, government oriented. And then um, TRIA. Yeah. The terrorism coverage, which where the Treasury acts as a reinsurance backstop for that. Um, before you get into how those pieces might play together, um, I can already I can already sense like there's already like wow this is such a gigantic problem, and I always try to I always try to kind of whittle it down to okay, but not all cases are gigantic problems. Right. Like if you were going to do, you know, an event cancellation for a carnival cruise by itself, that might be doable. But the, it, the, the scope of the entirety seems like very massive. And it gets to like your opinion on this before we try to put the jigsaw puzzle together is uh, in insurance. There never seems to be a concept of a minimum viable product. Yeah. When we do stuff, it's always got to be grand and big and, you know, cover, it covers cases that it wasn't, you know, supposed to cover. Uh, I write flood insurance, David, on a day-to-day -day basis. I have to issue terrorism quotes. I'm not sure why. Yeah. You know, but they, the government forces me to do it. And so that gets to, you know, um, we're in the middle of this. Everyone, uh, you know, there is the, uh, there already has been something put forward to do something with pandemics similar to the way we did terrorism. But maybe we need like a breather and allow, um, you know, a, a potentially allow an opportunity for minimum viable products like event cancellation, like small unit stuff where it's more binary. You yeah. know, it's either, it either happens or doesn't happen. And the pricing the pricing becomes much more straightforward because everything in the in the underwriting piece is binary, um, and we can clearly cla craft language on that. I want to get your opinion because you've been doing this for a while. Um, am, I, am I making sense here to try to to try to tackle it potentially in that way, or do you think that we should put a grand umbrella over this that may cause some entrepreneurship? Yeah, I, I, I think there's probably a case for both, right? And your idea of doing a minimal, minimally viable product is a good one, right? Why not start small so at least we get some coverages in place for certain companies? Um, you might also get that same, if you will, minimal coverage by maybe not necessarily thinking small about the product, maybe thinking larger about the product, but thinking about it through the lens of, of risk management. How do we get more people to buy the product if we can somehow create some sort of risk management adjunct to the product? So if you're uh, a restaurant and you have gone through a risk management protocol, uh, maybe mandated by the government, if it's a government program, for example, and you qualify, you, you've been vetted for how to keep your operations uh, relatively free from the pandemic exposure. Um, maybe you qualify for a lower rated a lower rated policy on a more broadly available product, right? So, so there are ways to sort of create an expansion of the number of people you touch with whatever product you create. One is find the minimally available product and sell it as much as you can. The other is to try and find a broader net, but make sure that the, that 
somebody is providing risk management solutions to those insured mm -hmm. so they can qualify for whatever that product is. That's the first thing. I think risk management is often not talked about in the context of creating a solution. And we're really good at risk management in this industry. If you look at the flood program, there's a ton of active risk management and risk mitigation that takes place to lower your premiums. There's no reason why we couldn't bring that approach to the pandemic world. I think the second thing is, is trying to create an environment where uh, you, you foster some sort of private-public partnership, not just on how it's administered, but encouraging competition for, if you will, certain of those insured. So they don't have to go into whatever the public part of the response is, whether it's a flood model or a crop model, right? It's creating an environment where um, a private version of that, of that form exists. That one's a little harder, but theoretically, after every major event we've had, we've had the private market come back and offer a product. Now, maybe the pricing is too high, but at least there is a product available. So whatever we do from a solution perspective should allow the industry the opportunity to price a competing product that doesn't avail, them, avail themselves of the public. I don't think we should lose sight of those two concepts. But to your point about the minimally available product, I think that's a great idea. Um, it may be that uh, you can argue that you've got some minimal coverage because it's, it's at least the minimum available. And what you do is you go to your bank and you say, listen, I've got a loan outstanding, but I bought this pandemic coverage. I want a lower cost of my, for my loan, right? You use that in available insurance coverage. You argue for a subsidy from the government for your premium because you've bought the minimally available product from a private insurance company, right? There are ways for you to lower your costs by buying that product, either through folks who, who provide you capital or maybe through the government because they're uh, they're focused on subsidizing some of those minimally available products. Yeah. So, you know, let's talk about the securitization aspect of it. Um, perhaps you can um, give a little primer on what would what would be the necessary pieces to have in place to get, uh, you know, the pension funds or whatever that have been funding securitizations in the cat property cat mar market to potentially want to do something there. You already talked about the pricing aspect of it. Uh, what would they need to see to make them comfortable to, uh, you know, what, what the capital markets like several trillion dollars makes the insurance market look like, uh, you know, a little startup in comparison. What would it take to get access to some of those several trillion dollars to cover some of these risks? Well, I, I, I want to be careful here because obviously while I have a great affinity for that market and I cut my teeth in that market, I'm, I'm not in it every day anymore. I certainly stay very close to some of the people in the market so I understand the issues and the important drivers. We won't hold it against you. You can, <laughs> but, <laughs> we're just spitballing. Yeah, but stepping back from it, I think the most important thing is, is for any securitization, doesn't matter whether it's a pandemic or it's, or it's, you know, uh, mortgages. Um, what investors want to understand is what is the probability of the loss likely to be? And what's the distribution of that loss likely to be? And knowing those things, I can create, if you will, in my mind, some pricing that allows me to determine what I will, I will accept as a return for accepting that volatility. And I think that's the big challenge here is how do you price the probability of a global pandemic or a regional pandemic? Yeah. Um, and how do you create some sort of uh, um, transaction that gives the investors comfort that they're sort of getting full value for money and they're willing to put the money into the transaction? So I think that, I think we have to think long and hard about that dilemma. Um, now, having said that, having said that, we had the same problem when the property cap market first started, right? We we were sort of theoretically pricing risk with models for one in a hundred year events, which in many cases had never occurred before. Um, so I don't want to say we can't do it. Um, I just think we have to be thinking about it in the way that the early property cat folks thought about um, what the probability of risk are. And as you might imagine, right, the, the distribution back in 1993 between the price you take for a property cat risk and the expected loss was way wider than it is today because now we have a lot more data to help us understand whether our volatility calculations have been reasonable or not. 
there's also supply demand dynamics, right? Which are yep. also shortening the pricing tail. And in theory, <laughs> under under a perfect environment, pandemic risk would be another diversifying classification for investors. No, it's scary. Yeah. But I, I'm not stupid enough to believe that's enough to convince them to buy um, yeah. a bond. So I, I think it can get done. I think it's hard, but and maybe, you know, maybe we get into a situation where some sponsors, maybe the government, maybe some of the world uh, uh, governmental agencies overpay for a while to drive demand for being invested in that securitization. Uh, those, those are all ideas I've got. You know, we can create models, we can create demand with overpaying, but it's going to take a long slog, but hopefully we've got enough time till the next one, right? If we start now, um, and, and it takes us 10 years to get the right equilibrium between pricing and, and, and risk and get a large enough capacity boost, um, maybe we've got some, maybe we've got a chance. Now, and again, with all of that said, what's our current issuance of securitization for property cat risk? Is it like 20 billion outstanding at the moment, something like that? I think that's a reasonable estimate. I haven't looked at the numbers for ages. Yeah. 20, billion not. Is not good, 20 billion is good, not going to cut it if we have a global pandemic. Yeah. Um, so that's a good point, right? Like even in the property cat space, it, the um, securitization might be up to like 50 billion dollars so it, yeah. i mean it's it's probably in you know 10 to 20 percent of the total reinsurance that's out there for property cat yeah um and growing um which is which is nice i think uh one advantage that a pandemic the pandemic has shown to have is that i think the uh epi models uh you have is almost like an excitement with the mathematicians and the quants who are just like, oh, I can be an epidemiologist now and, and create one of these models. So everyone's creating a model. They, those models seem to be on much better footing, even though they were wrong. Property cat models are wrong all the time. Even though those ones are wrong, I think those ones are a much better footing to sort of explain how these things work. Um, I, think, I think that's an advantage. I think one of the disadvantages we probably have is that we're in the middle of it and it's scaring the bejesus out of everybody. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think when we look back at some of the models used for this pandemic, including the IHE model, and we, we, we in theory, look back and test what the assumptions were and, and where they can be improved, um, we might be able to be on a better footing than we were with Property Cat. And if we start to use, if you will, uh, parametric-like triggers as the driver for you know, the loss on the bond, that may be another good advantage to, to that model versus say the property cat world. Yeah. Um, so, so I think it's possible. I, I, again, I'd reiterate that even if we were to do it properly, I'm, I'm not sure how much capital we would bring to bear on this problem. It truly is a ginormous problem in the context of what we're talking about. Yeah. It, it's so ginormous, David, that I've um, been a, I, I just released a podcast last week. Uh, the first one of several that are going to be talking about captives, insurance captives. And I, to me, it just seems like a no brainer. You're going to have a lot of businesses that are going to uh, ask their own internal leadership team, how do we avoid this ever happening to us again? And Nick, uh, and Nick I'll, I'll make it even more obvious. Your question is exactly right. In fact, our, the company I work for, that's a big topic for us right now. The next obvious step is if you're a large corporation, it's not just thinking about it within the context of your own company, but all your vital suppliers. And are you better off as a corporation to self-manage mm -hmm. this risk and maybe manage it on behalf of your key suppliers and deliver them risk management uh, in order to in insulate you and your key suppliers and key stakeholders from this risk? And we see at Gramercy, potentially a significant trend towards insurance companies losing out to big commercial companies with large captives who increasingly take on this risk themselves on behalf of their own company, but their key suppliers, um, and which is just another trend in, in theory that I think is going to bird is going to sort of create competition for the traditional insurance market, right? The Googles of the world are going to increasingly become their own insurance companies this business interruption risk is a classic example of why yeah. they would do that. Yeah. And with the captive, they have a lot more control 
over the triggers. Yep. So they can define what is a business interruption. And it could be as simple as my supplier can't get to me because a regional pandemic or a countrywide pandemic or a global pandemic has hit and my supplier can't get to me. That is going to trigger my policy and I'm going to now have cash infusion. And all of a sudden, David, I'm, I'm thinking of this is, um, you know, there have been a lot of negative articles written about stock buybacks, excessive dividends, excessive executive pay. And it's like, well, there's a, here's this other option here where you can now tell your investors, your shareholders and your stakeholders, we're, we're taking care of this. This is going to be part of our risk management. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I'm never for forced government action, but it might be interesting for the government to essentially say, one of the ways we can manage this risk better going forward is to induce these companies to, in effect, use better risk management techniques through their capital development, some of that financing through some sort of incentive schemes, right? You, you always want the government to play the last possible role um, unless they have to. And one way they can play a role is to help uh, is to help these companies, in effect, self-finance these exposures and, and give them tax credits. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure what they could do to do that, but I'm sure there are things they can do to encourage them to, to self-finance this risk. And by the way, that, that in theory creates a whole world of other opportunities, right? Where these companies, if they become giant insurance companies, they're going to need help to manage those insurance companies. So there, are, there is a host of insurance opportunity here. It may not be in the risk bearing part of it, but it may be in the administrating of those insurance programs on behalf of those captives. Yeah. Or reinsurance. Or reinsurance. You know, because that won't exist. So unlike, you know, a captive that's, um, you know, for let's say Amazon that might be, and I'm making this up, a captive for Amazon that might have a workers comp plan, uh, there may be reinsurance layered on top of that. So you know, if it, if it gets to some tail particular event, they can kind of risk transfer uh, that that part off of it. But then the incentive is on them to keep injuries low. You could have the same incentive uh, from risk management on a captive for a pandemic to make sure that, hey, not only are we going to take care of our company, but uh, this is going to extend out to our suppliers or whatever. So we're going to make sure they're taken care of as well. Absolutely. If if you and I know you, I, I know you know Zach Finn at University of yep. uh, Butler University. This is an area that Zach is really sort of keen on is to help these corporations understand that they may be better off financing this risk through their own insurance companies rather than relying on risk transfer pricing and contract frustration with the insurance carriers. Yeah, and the, and the huge advantage was the uh, captives already have the tax deduction for the premium you're paying in, um, you're right. Like it, the government could really come in and really season this. Yeah. Throw some, you know, some uh, salt and pepper on this to get this to with more tax deductions that would get a lot of attention. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. And I think some of the contacts that we at Gramercy are making uh, with sort of industry groups are, are, those are some of the conversations we're having to sort of encourage people to think about, self-financing these things rather than just simply the big blood, you know, bludgeoning hammer that the government can bring to a, a, a process, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I kind of wanted to finish off to kind of get your sense of how this is, might play out from an insurance. You know, you look in your crystal ball. Um, my sense is that day by day, I think it's getting uglier in that, um, even if the policies don't respond, even if the courts agree that the policies aren't going to respond, it's going to be a very expensive battle, no matter what. How do you? How how are you looking at it? Yeah, I think our corporate view here, at Gramercy, is we are we're sort of watching uh, what is sort of a, a, a it's sort of a strange tsunami, right? Last year we we started talking about social inflation and the increase in the frequency of claims in general. Um, the increasing awards at the jury level, uh, the increasing financing of the plaintiff's bar by Wall Street, and all leading to sort of upward trends in, you know, casualty business in the U.S. And something 
we at Gramercy were starting to sort of really pay attention to and advise our clients on. Now we've got this pandemic. And so it's kind of weird. You've got these, this sort of strange phenomenon where you've got a lot of businesses are sort of closed. So your typical activity of losses is not taking place. Right. So the average, you know, generic claims, less cars yeah. on the road. Yeah. Less, no, restaurants are closed. People aren't slipping and falling. So you're getting a, a less activity in those areas, but you're also not getting potentially the premium that goes with those. But you're getting a tsunami of new and emerging claims. And now a lot of them in the business interruption area are they're homogenous, right? They're arguing that they are owed money and there's a certain formulaic response to what that dollar response should be from the insurers. So the allegations are around whether the, the coverage is viable or not, right? Is pandemic excluded? Is pandemic not excluded? The more troubling area for us is what's going, hap what's happening more in the liability end of the world. Um, sort of allegations that maybe there's some negligence uh, on the part of a, a party for allowing someone into their restaurant and the restaurant was had a, a sick, uh, sick worker, um, more increasing sort of concern around the professional liability space where maybe people are going to start bringing lawsuits with respect to, well, why didn't the company buy pandemic insurance? You knew it was available. You, you, you could have bought it. You didn't buy it. I'm going to sue the directors and officers for yeah. failing to, to buy that insurance. Um, what about contingent BI, right? There's a whole bunch of related items that are coming out. And what's, what we in the casualty world really try to focus on is helping our clients understand that whatever cases emerge are really important precedents. And if you don't understand what that precedent will do and the potential second order effect, i.e. the next allegation using the same argument, and you don't get urgent coverage costs, uh, insurers facing a, 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 a lot of new coverage uh, conversations, so they have to pay for it, which traditionally they would not have bothered to, you know, it would not have been a big expense. But then there's just going to be how, how do you manage this litigation around the, the casualty side when this is a whole new world? So it's going to test some infrastructure issues. Everyone's were working remotely and traditionally um, many insurers, uh, uh, it's going to test our ability to get investigators in the field and will insurers, you know, have to worry about what happens if I can't get an investigator to a site? What will that do to my defense of a claim? There's some areas that we're testing that from an infrastructure place we, we haven't tested before. It'll be interesting to see how that, that emerges over the next few weeks. But our counsel to our clients is you need to start thinking about these issues now because this is only going to obviously build as the longer the, the lockdown uh, continues. Yeah. Um, this is crazy times. Like this is, I think precedence is the good word because we're going to be start seeing things we've uh, never seen before. Uh, I'll give you an example from property cat. Um, when we get an account that needs to be um, have an inspection, we can only do exterior inspections. We can't right. send somebody into the home and right. there's a, there's a liability for them now to do that. There's all of a sudden all these things we never had to really think about or worry about that are coming up. And, um, it's, um, it, this will almost be like the defining event. Yeah. And, Look and at those, like the, the, the hurricane Andrew of, of Nat cat, this will be similar. I agree. And, and think about all the potential entrepreneurial opportunities, right? You just mentioned the inability to get inside a property to do an inspection. What if you had a robot or, or a drone that could get inside of a building to inspect the building for, um, for at least enough of the purpose that you're trying to do? Yeah. Um, how do you get better technology to link people in from a remote working perspective? I mean, if you looked at London, uh, London's the, the use of e-placement for, um, for, for binders and for submissions is skyrocketing, right? That, and something that we never, we, we, we knew the industry was reluctant to embrace, but all of a sudden because they had to embrace it, they're suddenly embracing it. So there's going to be a ton of, of businesses that crop up or, or get much bigger uh, because I think this is testing the way our infrastructure was, was 
set up to handle and, and we're failing in some areas. So I think that's a good thing. I think it'll make our industry stronger going forward. I, I had to find, an, um, because I, I do excess and surplus lines, it's the quarter end. I have to file my ENS tax forms. They need right. those. A lot of those need to be notarized. Right. There's a, not a notary to be found. <laughs> I found an online notary. Yep. So unfortunately, my not notarization price goes from $5 now to $25. You would think digital would kind of bring that down, but I have access. I can just... It's, it's a Zoom meeting, and there's like a bunch of digital ways to do it. Like if we, if we really kind of sink our teeth into it, we can – this is the – this is a – could be a potential wonderful pivotal moment for insurance where we uh, have struggled with the technology aspect of our business, and this forces everyone – like this forces that CEO that did not want to make that, you know, $10 million investment – in technology because like how do I explain this right. right what if it goes wrong now he's got cover yeah to, to make that investment yeah it's it's amazing in the last month I've gotten more phone calls inbound from entrepreneurs in the tech space trying to see what our views are on on the applicability of their technology and then there's some things that frankly I think have been around a little bit longer we you and I have talked about litigation management software um, which now, you know, so it's so the lights are going on for a lot of a lot of insurance carriers, right? They're looking around going, wow, yeah, maybe I should be doing that in my business because for, for the longest time I had an argument why I didn't have to do it. Now I have no choice. Yeah. So we are going to see a hu huge amount of sweeping changes. There's no doubt. Yeah, yeah. Interesting times. Uh, it is. Thank Hopefully you so much. we get through it and, and get to the other side quickly, though. Well, stay safe. Wash you your hands. Know. Uh, take care of yourself and um, let's let's try to do this like on six month intervals. I think I think the audience would appreciate uh, gr the Gramercy David Mocklo view of of what you're seeing and, and how it's, um, it's probably different than a lot of st stuff that they're going to probably read. Yeah, I'd, l I'd love to keep in touch, Nick, and uh, stay safe and we'll, we'll talk soon. OK, thanks, everyone. Take care. And so my fellow Americans. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country.